Craig Bruce. Thank you much. So my talk's going to focus on a little bit different area, a bit more enterprisey, and how Django can be good for your health. So just a little bit about myself. I work for Open Scientific Software. We're a science company, hence this, this PhD thing I have. We do a lot of good science. Um, I'm going to show you some of that today. Um, and as has been alluded to, I'm also um, one of the kernel organizers for DjangoCon this year. Very pleased to be able to help out, along with Jeff, who is uh, an amazing conference organizer, as you're already seeing. So we're very lucky to have him on board. So the industry I work in is all to do with drugs and medicines. Uh, my former employers have been the world's biggest pharmaceuticals. I can't imagine anyone in this room has not taken some sort of medication at some point in their life. It's a really important part of healthcare. Um, but how do these drugs get made? You know, what is the process? There is, and I'm going to give you light on the science, a, a, a pipeline or a discovery pipeline for discovering or designing new drugs. Numerous stages, starting off with um, drug discovery. This is where we use uh, in silico techniques, i.e. on your computer, to design and to look at different compounds or things which might be a good drug. We do this, this is the area I work in. Um, once you've gone from millions of ideas down to thousands to hundreds, um, then you start making them in real life because it's expensive and slow to make a drug or to make a physical compound. And if we tried to make every potential drug we could, there's not enough time left in the universe to do it. So we can't try everything. So we've got to be really smart about it. Once we've found something that we think might be useful, we then go into preclinical, where we start making the drug, the actual compound itself, and we do tests on small cell um, samples, on plates, you know. In isolation, it's not anywhere as complicated as the human body, but just to make sure the things we predict in our computer are still happening in a pseudo-real fashion. And then we move into clinical phase trials, one, two, and three. This is where people start getting involved. We start testing the drug on people to see if it's working. We do placebos. We do all sorts of things to try and work out and to make sure what we think is going to happen really happens and the drug does help you make get, get, get better. And then before you can ever take a drug, the FDA needs to approve it as well. Um, this is the Food and Drug Administration here in the US. But every country in the world has its own FDA type um, equivalent. Um, so for drug companies, they have to go to all of these different agencies to get approval that the drug actually does what it says it does. This is complicated, long, fraught with things going wrong, often very near the end. So drug discovery, let's talk a little bit more about that. So if we have a, does anyone want to guess how long it takes for that process to happen, to get one single successful drug? How many years? 12, yeah, 12 to 15 years for a drug. And about the cost of that? It is way too much. It's a, a, an estimate is between 800 million to one and a half billion per successful drug. Successful drugs are the things which rarely happen. Most drugs are failures. They fail in clinical trials. Ideally, we want to fail really early on. We want to fail fast, fail quick, and importantly, fail cheap. We want to fail at the computer stage. We want to get rid of these things and never even bother making them because it's, it's too expensive. Um, but one thing drug discovery does have in common with the tech industry is IP protection. So when you design a new drug, the only way to really protect it is to pattern its structure. And this is a unique um, composition of atoms that make up your particular drug. Um, and these patents last for 20 years. But you can't take the pattern out at the end of the process once you've done your clinical trials, because by that point, you've had to publish what you've done, and everyone is now making the same thing you've just made. So you have to publish, you have to do your protection really early on, you know, in year two or three, and then you lose most of your protection while you're actually making sure it does what you think it's going to do, getting it approved, then it gets to the market. So you have a very little time to actually make back the cost, which is part of the reason they're so expensive. So where does Django fit into all of this? Um, there is two groups, um, which is the, the area I work in. You know, it's computational chemistry and cheminformatics. So this is very early on drug discovery when we're using our computers to work out if this potential compound might be a good drug or not. And we use a selection of 2D and 3D methods to look at these compounds to, to try and figure out using our scientific knowledge, are they going to be worthwhile making in real life? Cheminformatics, which is my, my specialism, is much more around the sort of the, the storage and retrieval of, of this data. So you can imagine we have many file formats for storing chemical data. How many of you here like the PDF format? OK, 
chemistry is full of PDF-like formats. It's really hard, it's very hard to go between them. Every vendor has their own version, there's open standards, it's just, it's really complicated, and the data we're handling is very complicated by nature. Um, and just to make this even worse, you know, computers don't know chemistry. There's no Microsoft chemistry. It just doesn't exist. We have to teach the computer all the chemistry. Um, and, chem and chemistry, you know, it's science. It's not a, a solved known quantity. Some things we know, some are many things we just don't. And we're ever having to teach just more knowledge into the, into the software, which is really tricky. So when I tell people my chemists, they often think white coat and goggles. Not true at all, um, but for computational chemists anyway. Um, I'm a disaster in a real lab, <laughs> which is why many of us converted over to doing what's known as dry chemistry on the computer. Um, I do still wear goggles occasionally. We like um, doing 3D, or some chemists like doing 3D. So whereas you've all been to the cinema now to see a 3D film, chemists have been doing that for two decades, or three decades even. Um, so the lab that we work in looks a little bit more like this. Um, that top image on the left is a Cray supercomputer. Um, HPC, high performance computing facilities, are really common for drug discovery. We want to look at taking one particular drug and we want to see if we put it in our huge collection of internal um, compounds and proteins, is it going to bind with this protein? Will our new drug bind with this protein? Will it be something interesting? And it takes a lot of computational resources to do that, which is why HPC is really important. And one of the sort of special hardware pieces are SGIs, which is the picture on the, on the lower left. Um, these were some of the first machines I started doing computational chemistry on. They run a flavor of Linux known as Irix. So that's my first introduction to Linux. And this is where you're running your software locally, and then when you're ready, you're running a massive batch job on a Cray or a, on a huge supercomputer. But you know, you're working for a big pharmaceutical, a Fortune 500 company. Everyone else, including you, also still has a corporate desktop or laptop. And there's a reason I picked that particular operating system. It's an old one. Um, Many of the customers I serve still use, thankfully they're off of XP, but you know, Vista and Windows 7 are the standard workbenches for people's um, enterprise IT. And we have to shoehorn the chemistry into this as well, which makes it really hard. Um, in keeping with enterprise, they like to use these sorts of things. They're really popular. Java Web Star, Java Applets, that, that spinning logo when it's all gonna crash your browser is just all, all too common and really depressing. Old data browsers are locked down, you're unable to store new browsers, you can't upgrade the version of the browser because then you can't do your expenses. It's like, how, how does it help you with discovery? It makes it really tough. Um, but computational chemists were lucky because they have these SGIs and supercomputers as well. So they're still locked down on their Windows machine, but they've got a Linux environment as well. And that gives them a lot of freedom because the administration is generally a bit more relaxed so they have a chance to explore. Um, so what did they start doing? They looked around and they found things like this. Staple books for comp chemists. A learning pearl and learning CGI, which translates to your first website. This is interesting, now I've got Irix, I've got Apache, I've got Perl, I've got CGI. I do something exciting, something different, something interesting. So it's useful to start designing and helping me discover more drugs. Um, so that my first project was using Perl and actually a Perl cartridge which had knowledge of chemistry, so we could handle chemistry in Perl and then share it through a website. And that was, that was a ten year, over 10 years ago. And it's just so much easier, and that has improved so much. Obviously, thankfully, Perl is uh, used less now. Um, people are moving on to Python, and thankfully, Django. Other things that became really popular are uh, media, worker, um, media Wiki. So a lot of companies, this is one of my former companies, have an internal media work installation. So now you've got PHP in the mix as well. So it's still the P's, but it's not quite the right one we wanted to use. And here we have a custom plugin to um, MediaWiki to show some chemistry, um, where we can just take some chemical data and we can visualize it for you. So I want to talk to you about a case study about the, the big project I worked on a few years ago. It's called Design Tracker. So this is a Django project, a Django application that is used um, worldwide um, by, by AstraZeneca. So one of the largest pharmaceuticals. Every chemist in the company uses this tool. It started off in one site um, as a small prototype just because it was useful and it was interesting. And it slowly adopted across all the different sites and now is a core part of their discovery chain. So I apologize these aren't in color, but uh, these companies are very, um, 
pro IP and secrecy, so getting anything out that's past the lawyers is very tough. So this is a screenshot of Design Tracker. This is a Django form. This is showing you the ideas we've been working on and the progress of them. So a computational chemist will go in here, will enter their compounds. These will be registered. You can see the visualizations of them. And then they're handed to a synthetic chemist to actually make them. So we take our ideas, we talk about them, we discuss them in meetings, and then we say, of these you know, 20, let's make these five. These look the most interesting. Let's make these. And Design Tracker can keep a, a, an eye on if it, these are ideas, if they've been made, if they've been tested. And anyone from the team can log on and have a look. And this idea of collaboration has become really big. You've seen it you know, in Google Docs and everywhere else. It's just the same in pharma. We need to collaborate to do the best things. So here we have a, another, another screenshot Design Tracker. Here we have a, a hover over as we're looking at all these different projects. As um, chemists normally work on multiple projects at once. Um, each idea will have like some core, and there's a reason why I want to investigate this area. Then we have some other ideas. So this provides a really nice way to just have an overview of what's going on. Um, and then a simple JavaScript hover over. You wouldn't believe how excited people were when they saw this, because it's just so much better than the, the other things they've had to use before, which were often X11 interfaces of the Java web start, which would then start, you do your work, and then crash, you have to do it all again. And uh, just being in the browser was so much more flexible. It's made a, made a real difference, and people enjoy it um, so much. So that's why I worked on uh, AstraZeneca. And now OpenAI, we are shifting uh, our, our focus. So we do a lot of stuff that runs on these high-performance computers. You know, our stuff is very expensive to run from a computational stance. So we have um, started working on a project we're calling Orion, which is our cloud platform. Um, we want to give access to a HPC on demand, so we're using Amazon to do that. Something that you take for granted every day, you can go to Heroku or Amazon to launch your apps, and it's really easy. Our customers can't do that. They're not allowed to do it. IT will get in the way, legal will get in the way, um, and if they do go ahead and do it, often they get into a lot of trouble. So we want to provide them a solution to do that. And Orion is powered, or the core of Orion is all around Django, Django REST framework, and a whole load of uh, third-party packages um, which means we can focus on doing the stuff that we're good at, which is the science. So I and OpenAI are really grateful to, to Django for being here and being so well supported. Um, it made a real big difference to us. Um, while we do contribute to you know, third-party packages and, and Django as well, um, we feel our, our value add isn't doing the science, as do our customers. And just the, the little things. Um, so we did get pushback at AstraZeneca for using Python and Django. You know, it's not enterprise ready, it's not secure, it's, it's like, really? Is it really, is it that bad? So, so little things that the community have changed in the last few months, like the announced release schedule and the security updates, they're really important to help us convince people that Django is a, is a secure, mature platform, and that really helps when it comes to getting it set up. So I can't show you Orion, but I am gonna do something a little bit stupid and quiet, a really quick demo, um, to show you some of our 3D visualization. So this is a talk from one of our, um, well, slides from one of our talks, um, our customer user meeting, although you can't see it. Uh, this is why I knew it was a stupid idea. There we go. Ta-da, there. Okay, so we've taken a Wikipedia page and you know, regular page, some, here's a protein on the side, and we've hijacked it slightly um, to put one of our, our JavaScript-based plugin. So remember I told you previously, these plugins are always you know, with applets, so I probably just crashed the page historically. Now this is 100% JavaScript. Um, there's no need for us to crash the browser or anything like that. And it works on any browser and on your iPad, which Java really doesn't work on. So here we have a protein, which we can spin around. We can zoom, this is all done native in real time, um, and there's much better graphics than anything we've had before. Um, this is WebGL, yes. Um, here is our, it's a, a, it's a potential, it's a medicine, here's a ligand, and here it is sitting in its protein. And this is what chemists, comp chemists, medicinal chemists like to use to show, to see what's going on. And this is just one of the pieces that's going into Orion. Um, so, I think my time is about up. I just want to say thank you very much for listening. Um, I'll be more than happy to take questions later on today or, or tomorrow. <laughs>
Um, so happy birthday, Django, and please keep up the amazing work. It makes our lives much easier. Thank you very much. <laughs>